so glad you guys could be here, every single person. We're continuing our series going through the, the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. And I'm going to read a story this morning. It's kind of obscure. And I'm not going to lie, I guarantee you, for me at least, and maybe you guys are in the same boat, but I've often skimmed this story because it didn't make sense. Uh, but I think when you understand it, there's a great theological, historical, and most importantly, practical lesson for today. So we're in Mark chapter 9. Starting in verse 2, it says this, is after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There, Jesus was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling as white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is so, so good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I love verse six. It says, he didn't know what to say, for he was so frightened. So honestly, I don't even know why I said that. Verse seven, then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud and said, this is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Verse 8, I need you guys to see this. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. I said, suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Except Jesus. They only saw Jesus. Come on, somebody. I want to call our message this morning only Jesus. Only Jesus, only Jesus. And you guys can take a seat. Thank you so much, worship team. So glad you could join us. Hey, listen, every single person online, I'm so glad you guys chose to be here with us. And every person in the building, so glad you guys could be here. If you don't know, my name's Harrison, and uh, I'm just so pumped you're here. Um, I'll let you guys know a little something. I'm reading a book right now, and uh, this book is called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. Now, the reason that I bought this book is because I follow um, an author, I follow a pastor uh, on social media, and he recommended this book. Do you guys have people you follow and like whatever they kind of recommend, like you trust them? This is kind of, no one. <laughs> this, is kind of, this is kind of a situation for me. I trusted him. He recommended this book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, and what he said um, was that this is the best book ever written um, on the subject of the, the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, being firsthand eyewitness reports. This is the best book ever written. And so I enjoy him as an author, and so I figured if he read it, I'm going to read it. And so he actually provided an Amazon link right on his page. I clicked the Amazon book, uh, the, the link, and I ordered the book. Now, uh, the only thing, like I didn't read any reviews. I just took his word for it. I was like, this is going to be good. The only thing that kind of stuck out to me uh, was that the book cost $60. And that's like the most expensive book I've ever bought in my entire life. And I didn't really know why it was so expensive. Uh, but I found out a few weeks, a few days later, not weeks, Amazon Prime, come on somebody. I found out a few days later uh, why it was so expensive when a big box showed up in my house. Now usually when I order books, they come in envelopes. This thing came in a box because it was so huge. And in this box was this big book, this hard-covered book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, over 700 pages. Now, I'm not going to lie. It's the biggest book I've ever uh, started to read, I guess, other than the Bible. But when I finish this book, I'm going to put it on my shelf, and I'm going to let people know I read this book. <laughs> and it's going to be a really big flex. And when I'm done, I'm going to give myself an honorary PhD for reading the book. Now, this book is thick, and the reason it's thick and over 700 pages is because it's a scholarly book. Have you guys ever read a scholarly book before? In, in really any field. And one thing I've realized about scholarly books, be it theology, psychology, biology, is that I find for these authors of these books, I think for them, like the bigger their book is, the bigger the flex it is from them. And so a lot of times, like, what, what I've found is there'll be, like, one or two kind of key concepts per chapter, but they'll, like, spend 30, 40, 50 pages explaining one key concept. Anyone ever experienced that? Maybe online, some more scholarly people watching. 
And so it's funny because uh, in preparation for this sermon, um, I'm reading, I was reading a different book. And in this other book that I was reading, it actually quoted, but more of a paraphrase, uh, this book, Jesus and the Eyewitness. And so nothing makes you smarter than reading one book and another book is quoted and you're like, oh, I'm actually reading that book as well. But it was, re- it was really funny in this book because literally there's a chapter and this chapter is over 50 pages, super long, and it's talking about memory, how we know if a memory is valid or not. And super long, it's got court cases, case studies, so on and so forth, 50 pages. This other book that I read, it was able to summarize the entire chapter in this. It said one of the reasons that you know memories are valid is not necessarily specific and important details, but it's actually random and unimportant details. Because the way in which our memory works is that it remembers random things. Uh, That's it. He was able to sum up 50 pages in like two sentences. Now, now listen, I think that it's a great gift to be really smart and scholarly and be able to write 700 pages. But I also think it's equally as important and equally as gifted to be able to take a really really, um, complex topic and make it simple. And that's what he was able to do. And so this morning, and the reason I'm telling you guys this story is because I want to go through, and we read this story, um, and it's actually kind of a little bit more of a complex story. But what I want to do is I want to make it simple. You guys okay with that? And so I'll tell you this. The reason that this story is kind of complex is because in this story, there is allusions to other stories. In fact, there's heavy imagery that builds on the Old Testament, but the story we're reading is in the New Testament. And so a lot of times, my big thing, I say this, I say all the time, I say, listen, the Bible is not as complicated as you think. Just start reading it, and I guarantee it will speak to you. However, sometimes, someone say sometimes, sometimes there are some things that have a little bit more depth. And maybe you've been there before where you kind of skim it because it's like, this thing doesn't make sense. But what I found oftentimes is a lot of things that we don't understand, sometimes the more obscure and complex stories in the Bible often have the deepest meaning. And so what I want to do is I want to break down this story in Mark chapter 9, and I want to make it simple. This is an important story because it's found in three out of the four Gospels, and it's also found um, in, in 2 Peter which lets me know this is an important story. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to make this complex story simple, if I have your guys' permission. But I do, in order to make it simple, I do need to teach a little bit. So can I teach a little bit? And then, and then um, I'll preach. But first, I need to teach. Online, if you're there, you can say, I'm here. Mark chapter 9. It's the best I got for you guys. Um, Mark chapter 9. Verse 2, it says, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led him up a high mountain where they were all alone. There, he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before him Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Now, when you look at this story, I don't know what goes through your mind, but maybe the first thing is like, what the bleep is going on? And by bleep, I mean heck. Calm down, people. <laughs> Just didn't want to swear in church, but here we are. Like, what is going on? Like, Because there's, there's a whole lot of weird things happening in this story. And so for the original readers, here's the thing I want us to understand. The people that would have originally re- read this would have an understanding of the Old Testament. And so there would have been things that would have stuck out to them naturally that maybe don't stick out, out to us as much. And and, and even the things that stick out to us, we might not understand the meaning as they once would have. So there's four things that in this story are going to stick out that are important right there that we just read. Number one is the mountain. Number two is Jesus' disposition, the fact that he's glowing. Come on, somebody. And Elijah and Moses. These are characters, people uh, that have been gone for over a thousand years, but they showed up. So those are the four things that are important. And so here's what I want to understand. Mark chapter 9 is actually making a reference, an allusion to an Old Testament story found in Exodus 24, but more specifically Exodus 34. And I need us to understand this because it's extremely important. Because in Exodus 34, there is a scene that involves Moses. 
And if you haven't been in church for a long time, maybe you don't know a lot about Moses, or maybe you've just seen the Prince of Egypt. But Moses, <laughs> and chances are you're probably a Christian if you've seen the Prince of Egypt. It's not a big non-Christian movie as far as I know. Um, but Moses is one of the central characters of the Old Testament. And so what you need to know is in Exodus 34, this scene is a replication of what we were seeing in Mark chapter 9. There's similarities, but there's also differences. The similarities in the scene are this. Moses in Exodus chapter 34, he goes up onto a mountain. And on that mountain, he gets the commandments of God, the Ten Commandments, the law of God, also known as the law of Moses. And that's really important to understand. That's Exodus 34. Number one, he gets the law. Number two, he comes into the literal presence of God. And Moses says to God, he says, God, let me see your glory. I want to experience your glory. I love this story. And God says, guess what? You can't see my glory, otherwise you'll die. So I can't show you my face, but here's my backside. So God moons him. Listen, the Bible's not boring. You're boring. <laughs> he doesn't actually moon. He shows him his backside. And so Moses gets a glimpse of the glory of God. Is everyone following? Those are the two things of importance. He gets the commandments and he gets a glimpse of the glory of God. And so Exodus 34 verse 29 kind of gives us a good recap. It says in verse 29, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant of law in his hand, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and the other Israelites saw Moses and that his face was radiant, they were afraid to come near him. Because his face is glowing, that's kind of scary. But listen, there's actually a great lesson here, and this lesson still applies today. Anytime you come into the presence of God, there is a literal change in your radiance. There is a literal change in your demeanor. This is not just Old Testament, this is New Testament as well. Anytime you come into the presence of the living God, something changes. Listen, the mark of following Jesus is not what you do, it's not what you wear, it's not if you go to church, it's the fact that there is actually something different about your disposition. Have you guys ever met someone and you're like, wow, I think that person's a Christian. I don't know if they go to church, but there is a radiance about them. There's a glow to them. There's, there's something inside of them. And so in Exodus 34, Moses radiates the glory of God. So we just read Mark chapter 9, and we've seen Exodus 34, and there's, sim there's similarities, right? But there's also differences, and the differences are extremely important. Let me show you this. Mark chapter 9, verse 2 again. Jesus, Peter, James, and John went up to a mountain. Similar. While he was there, Jesus was transfigured before him, before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. This is really important. Because in Exodus 34, Moses reflects God. He reflects God. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus transfigures. Now what transfigures mean, one scholar said this, the word transfigures describes a change on the outside that came from the inside. Why is this important? Because Moses was a human. And because Moses was just a person, all he can do is reflect the glory of God. All we can do as people is reflect the glory of God. Jesus, when he goes on this mountain, he doesn't reflect the glory of God. The glory of God comes from within. He's transfigured. Why? Because Jesus is not just another person. That's what they're trying to let us know in Mark chapter 9. Jesus is more than just a person. He literally radiates the glory of God. He does not reflect the glory of God. He radiates it because he is God. This is important because some people will say, man, you know what? Jesus was a really great teacher. He's just a really great teacher. In fact, some people will say the Gospels don't actually really explicitly say that he's God. Well, maybe not, ex maybe not uh, uh, explicitly, but right here, implicitly, it's letting us know that he's radiating something. He's doing something that no one else could do. This is really important. Because the readers who read this, they'd be transposed to Exodus 34. And they would think, man, there's someone great. Someone great like Moses. You need to understand in the history of Israel, the people of God, Moses is one of the central characters, one of the central figures. And so they would think to themselves, here comes another Moses. Because he's going up onto the mountain. But the fact that he begins to transfigure is letting us know that he is someone completely different. Now, up until verse 3, 
Moses doesn't actually show up. And so if you miss the reference, that's okay. But the reason Moses shows up is to make sure that no one misses it. But it doesn't show up alone. So Mark chapter 9, verse 4, it says, There appeared before him Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. So now this moment gets even weirder for James, Peter, and John. Jesus goes from glowing white to all of a sudden, Moses, who's a dead guy, and Elijah, uh, who's never actually seen death. You can go read his story. But he's there. So Moses and Elijah are there standing before Jesus. Now, this again, I'm still teaching. Is everyone following? I got to teach a little bit. It's going to come together. You're going to see it in a second. But Moses and Elijah are really significant here. I've already told you that Moses is really important. And the reason that Moses is important is because for the people that knew anything about God, Moses was a representation of the law of God. He was a representation of the commandments of God. Now, what you need to understand is that the law was the way in which the people of God identified themselves. Their identity was built on keeping the commandments of God. And so Moses here is a representation of that, and he's standing there. So we have the law. Next person that shows up is Elijah. Now, Elijah is a prophet in the Old Testament. And in fact, he's probably considered the greatest of the prophets. And so in the Old Testament, the prophets had two functions. Number one, their function many times was to bring people back to the law. To let them know, hey, you're not following God's law you're going to die, you're going to be exiled, so on and so forth. But as time went on, the prophets began to take on a new and more meaningful role. What they began to do is they began to prophesy that someone was coming, that a savior was coming, that a Messiah was coming. And so right now in this moment, I need us to understand this. We have the central characters in the story of God's people. We have Elijah, which is a representation of the prophets, and Moses, who is a representation of the law. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what happens next, Peter, who is a good Jewish person, he says to Jesus, Rabbi, man, it is good to be here. And you need to understand, for a Jewish person to be there in that moment, this was like seeing your favorite celebrities. This was, a, he's like, bro, it is so good for me to be here. So what he says is this. He says, let's build three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Now a shelter is a tabernacle or a memorial. And so literally what he's saying, he's like, hey, let's build some memorials for these guys. Let's honor them. I'm going to build one for you, Jesus, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now you need to understand, this seems logical. And in a sense, it's almost honoring. Because what Peter is doing, Peter is understanding, man, Jesus, you are as important as the two biggest characters in the history of Israel, which a lot of people didn't see. And so he's mad. He's like, I'm going to honor Moses, I'm going to honor Elijah, and I'm going to honor you, Jesus. Now, verse 6, in parentheses, and I love this part, because if you've been with us in this series, what you'll know is that Mark wrote his account of this gospel based on Peter's eyewitness. And so when Mark is like, Peter, why did you say that? Peter, looking back on history, is saying, oh, he's like, honestly, man, I was so scared. I didn't know what to say. But the reason he's also saying that is because what he realizes now in hindsight was that he said the wrong thing. He said, I want to build one for you, Jesus, and Moses, and Elijah. I have Jesus, and I have Moses, and I have Elijah. You see, it seemed good what he was doing. It's good for us to be here. But what he didn't realize and what he only realizes in hindsight is that it is never Jesus and. It's only Jesus. It's only Jesus. You see, Peter understands only in hindsight that what he did in that moment by putting Peter, by putting Jesus, Elijah, and Moses on the same level, he was making a mistake because it's never Jesus and. Is only Jesus. Now, I want us to ask this question now. Because I think no matter who we are in our lives, a lot of us have a Jesus and. We have a Jesus and. What's an and? An and is anything that I build my identity on that is not Jesus. You see, you need to understand for the Jewish people, their identity was built in the law. And that was their and. And so here's the question I want to ask for us this morning. What's your and? What's your end? What is the thing that you build your identity on that isn't Jesus? 
Now, I know for a lot of people watching, maybe it's not Jesus and. It's like, I only have an only right now. I'm new to this journey. And hey, guess what? I'm so happy you're here. But for a lot of us, we try to follow Jesus. We try to put our identity in him. But what happens is it's hard to be in Jesus alone, so we begin to have Jesus and. And if we're honest, what happens is things in our lives, be it politics, sports, work, relationships, sexuality, we begin to build our identities in these things. And for so many of us, it's not Jesus and. It's actually blank and Jesus. My identity is built in something else first. And so what's happening in this story is that Jesus is teaching them a lesson that we build our identity in Jesus only. And so when I ask the question, what's your and? I'm really asking it. What's your and? What is the thing that you build your identity in? Now, you guys heard some of the examples I said, politics, sports, sex, relationships, whatever it is. Now, maybe you're saying to yourself, Harrison, like, is it wrong to have other like hobbies and interests? That's not what I'm saying at all. If you only read the Bible, go outside, you're weird. What I'm saying is that the problem that happens in life is when we begin to build our identity in things that are not Jesus. You see, if there's one thing that I think has been exposed in this last year, it is the idols of our heart. In other words, it is the thing that we build our identities on. And what this last year has exposed is that for so many of us, we have not actually built our identity on Jesus. Our identity has actually been in something else. And so for a lot of us in this last year, I'll say this, we've built our identity in politics. And maybe I know like it's, it's easier to say that's just the Americans, right? That's an American thing. Only the Americans do that. But can we be honest? I think in this last year, I've heard this more than ever. It's like, you know what? I'm a, I'm a conservative Christian. I'm a liberal Christian. But I'm a democratic Christian. I'm a Republican Christian. I'm an independent Christian. You see, and I want you to understand, there's nothing wrong with having political leanings. But what happens so often, and I even love the way that we say it, is that so often ideologies can turn into idols. And they can turn into things that we put in front of Jesus. <laughs> I'm a conservative Christian. I'm a liberal Christian. I'm a, I'm a democratic. Listen, what if we just said, I'm a follower of Jesus, full stop. I'm a Christian. My identity is in Christ. It's funny, if you guys, and I think the reason we do this is because our culture lacks identity. And so what happens is we are looking for things to put our identity in. And so a culture that doesn't have identity, in other words, a culture that doesn't know where their worth comes from or what it's built on, will look and grasp at anything to find identity. I'll look to sexuality to find my identity. I'll look to relationships to find my identity. I'm a single Christian. I'm a straight Christian. I'm a married Christian. What if we're just Christians? Listen, our church... um, if, if you guys don't know, we're, we're, we're a non-denominational church. And um, a lot of people ask, like, what does that mean? And, like, literally, it just means that we're not affiliated with the denomination. Um, but a lot of people are like, hey, what do we call ourselves? Like, are we non-denominational? And I get it all the time. Are we non-denominational Christians? I'm like, listen, first off, you call whatever you want to call yourself. That is not my job. I was like, but for me, I just want to call myself a Christian. Because I I don't want to build my identity in something else. I don't want to build my identity in an ideology because ideologies so often turn to idols. If you understand the history of Christianity, we have done this for 2,000 years. It's in the New Testament. There are people that said, hey, I'm a follower of Paul. And then a guy's like, I actually follow Apollos. And then after that, it's like, "I'm I'm a Lutheran. I'm a Calvinist, I have Reformed theology, I have Armenian theology, I'm a Pentecostal, I'm a Baptist, so on and so forth. And again, I want you to understand there's nothing wrong with having theological leanings. But what happens, and I want you to understand the risk, is that ideologies so often turn into idols. And we have Jesus and, or in many cases, we have and Jesus. And here's the thing I want us to understand. Christianity and the message of Jesus by definition is inclusive. But what happens with ideologies so often is ideologies become exclusive. And they actually cause division and they actually cause separation. And many times the ands in our life, whatever they may be, they actually ostracize us from other people. And what it means to follow Jesus is to be all about other people. 
But what happens when we have ands and we have identities that are built in ideologies, often these become idols and walls are built around us. And so Jesus is trying to show them a great question, a great lesson in this moment. And I believe this morning he wants to ask us, what's your and? What is the thing that you're building your identity on? What is the thing that you are looking to to bring you life? Now, the story is just getting started because God, what he's about to do, he's about to get rid of one of the biggest ands for the Jewish people and for many people today. So again, Moses and Elijah show up. He says, I didn't know what to do. I was just scared. Um, but then verse 7, it says, A cloud appeared and covered them. And a voice came from the cloud and said, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Now, this is really important because Moses, or, or, uh, Peter has just said, Hey, I want to build a memorial for Moses, for Elijah, and for Jesus. I want to honor the law. I want to honor the prophets, and I want to honor Jesus. In that moment, (laughs) Jesus being transfigured wasn't enough, so God himself decides to speak. And a voice says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Listen to him. You need to understand, he is giving Jesus an authority that has never been given to anyone anyone in the past or anyone since. You need to understand, God spoke through Moses. Moses. God spoke through the law. God spoke through prophets. In Jesus, God speaks from. Jesus has the authority because Jesus is God. So he says, listen to him. In other words, Jesus has an authority that Moses and Elijah never had. That Moses, Elijah, no one in the history has ever had. And so verse 8, it says, suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. It was only Jesus. And so in the moment, God gets rid of the things, and in this case, the idols that they had. The law is gone. The prophets are gone. And only Jesus remains. Here's the implication. This was the start of something new. Something radically new. But here's the even bigger bigger implication. This moment is the beginning of the end of religion. This moment was the beginning of the end of religion. Now you need to understand something, specifically when it comes to Moses. Moses being a representation of the law. For the people of God, their identity was built in the law. Their identity was built in their faithfulness to the law. What that meant for a Jewish person, the reason people knew that they were followers of God was because of what they did. It was because of the laws that they kept, the days they kept holy, the stuff that they would or would not eat, their festivals, their ceremonies, their sacrifices. The law was what their identity was built on. In a sense, it was built on rules. Now, you need to understand something. In the law, there is nothing inherently wrong with it. What is wrong is the hearts of people. And what happens, and this is the downfall of people, anytime you begin to govern your life on rules, your heart doesn't actually change. And so what happened was this system was built for the Jewish people where they were faithful to the commandments of God as best as they could be, but their hearts began to harden. And the reason their hearts began to harden, and this is the issue with religion. And when I say religion, what I mean is is just um, this idea that what you do is how you connect to your God. And what you do is how you gain standing with your God. And so what happened for these people is that they tried to follow all of these rules and these regulations to the T. And the truth is they never really followed them that well. But what happened was this system was built where because they did certain things better than everyone else, they began to believe and think that they were better than everyone else. And so they began to look at the people around them as less than worthy, as unclean, as undignified, as enemies. And so what happened was the law, although it was good, it actually created division. Because this is the problem with rules, is that rules and truth have this way of puffing you up, have this way of making you think think that you're better than other people. And the thing is this, rules are easier to follow than actually changing your heart. 
And so as people, we are predisposed to following rules. Because it's easier to follow rules, I said, than it is to actually change our hearts. And so a lot of people listen to that, you're saying, wait, these people thought because of what they did that made them better than other people? Like that kind of doesn't necessarily just sound like ancient Judaism. That kind of sounds like modern day Christianity. Where what we do makes us better than other people. Because of how we act makes us better than other people. The thing is this, when it comes to Christianity, we don't follow rules, we follow a person. Truth is not found in the law, truth is found in a person. It's found in a man named Jesus, who was more than a man, but God. And so this is why we say all the time, Christianity isn't actually a religion, because we just follow a person. You see, what happens is that rules and regulations make us arrogant, and maybe you've never seen it in church, but I'll give you a very practical, everyday example. How many of you guys have heard of COVID before? A few people. Some of you guys came in from the country. In this last year, for the first time, probably in a lot of our lives, um, the government has played a much bigger role in our lives. To be honest, straight up, uh, I didn't know Jason Kenney was the pre premier before like 12 months ago. I just, I just don't pay attention. Um, and you guys can laugh, but none of y'all knew Dina Hinshaw 12 months ago. Um, but what's funny is the way in which, and I'll preface by this, I want you to understand that I truly believe in my heart that the government, everything that they're doing is because they believe that they have the best interest of people in mind. Now, you are led to your own opinions on <laughs> if they're doing a good job of that. But what's happened in this last year is that our lives have now been governed by rules. And I think, and a lot of us have experienced it, you have begun to experience a world or a people that live under law. Now, we've always lived under law, I understand that, but we've never lived under law to this extent. And so what happens, and here is the nature of when we begin to govern our lives only by rules, is that we become very arrogant. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, but I'm sure all of us, maybe we felt it in our heart or we've seen it in other people. But the more you think you follow the rules, it is almost impossible to not believe that you are better than the people that don't follow the rules. And so this arrogance is built. And it's like, oh my gosh, that person didn't wear a mask to Superstore? What a monster! <laughs> I saw this guy, um, and he was talking, and it's just kind of pointing out the way we live. Um, he said, I jog every single day. And I run three miles. And he said, when I jog, I wear a mask outside. And he said, the least you people can do is wear a mask inside. Now, I want you to understand, I'm just trying to paint a picture of what happens. The more we begin to follow rules or the more we begin to govern ourselves by rules, it is next to impossible to not believe that we are better than other people. Because truth has this way of puffing us up. And so what Jesus is doing in this moment is Jesus is trying to completely change the way that things have been done. Because the people of God before were governed by law. But now he is trying to bring a new way where everyone is governed by grace. Because here is the downfall of law and the truth of why we need grace. At the end of the day, when we think, whatever it is, I'm past COVID now. Whenever you think you follow rules better than someone else, number one, someone follows better than you. But number two, in some area, in some way, you will be made a hypocrite. You will fall short. You will not be enough. Here's the truth. This is like driving. Any of you guys ever got cut off before? Or someone did something really stupid? And you're like, man, those people are the worst drivers in the entire world. Did they, do they not know the speed limit? Do they not know the rules? What an idiot! But can we be honest, how many of us have ever made a mistake on the road? I, I don't know what happened. Like, it was like two months ago. I, I think I was zoned out. Maybe I was worshiping my car. I don't know. But like, I drove, I was driving, and I looked to my, to my, to my right, and there was a lady, and she was giving me the finger. <laughs> but listen, it wasn't like a, an angry finger. It was a very passive-aggressive one. She was giving me the finger, but she was looking straight ahead. I said, at least look me in the eyes when you give me the finger. But the truth is, the truth is, I didn't even know what I did. 
Like, I, was, I don't know if I wasn't paying attention, but I just looked at it and I was like, what is going on? But here's the thing, and this is what is supposed to keep us humble on the road, but it's also supposed to keep us humble in life. Although other people are stupid, although other people mess up, I'm stupid. I mess up. I make mistakes. I don't always follow the rules. The faultiness of the law and the beauty that is found in Christ is that we all fall short. So in this moment, you need to understand when it says only Jesus remains, this is a beautiful picture. Because everything, the way in which things were done in the past, the old has passed away and the new has begun. And in this moment, what Jesus was trying to do was he was trying to end the system of religion. He was trying to end a system that was built on our faithfulness, on your faithfulness, and build a system on his faithfulness. Romans chapter 6 puts it nicely. It says, sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. You live under the freedom of God's grace. Here's the implications. What, Mo, what Peter was trying to do, he was trying to give weight and worthiness to Moses and worthiness to the prophets. In the moment when only Jesus remains, it's twofold. Number one, what that lets us know is the law has gone away. There's a new way to govern things. When Elijah disappears, the implication is this. The thing that you were looking forward to, you no longer have to look forward. He's here. He's here right now. The old is gone. And so in Jesus' way, it's not about what you do, but it's about what Jesus has done. Can I tell you something? The reason that we live in a culture that is searching so desperately for identity is because we want to feel like we have worth. We want to feel like there is something that we have done that makes a huge difference. And so we build our identity in, in, in politics, in ideologies, in relational status. But what happens when only Jesus remains He's letting us know that our identity is found in Christ and I did absolutely nothing to achieve it. So here's what I want us to understand. Christianity is the only identity that is received, not achieved. Christianity is the only identity that is received, not achieved. You see, ideologies, labels, they puff us up. Why? Because inherently we did something to receive them. We did something that makes us better than other people. My label, my job description, I did it. And so, so what happens for so many of us, it puffs us up. But what Christianity is supposed to do, it's supposed to let us know that we are actually to be humble because there's nothing that you did to inherit your greatest identity. And that is a son and daughter of Jesus, the King Most High. I'll tell you this, church, if there's anything in our Christianity that puts us above other people, we don't understand Christianity. If there's anything in following Jesus that puffs us up or makes us feel above, superior, or better than other people, we do not understand what it means to follow Jesus. And so what God wants to do this morning is God wants to smash the and in our lives. He wants to get rid of it. And so you need to understand in this story, when only Jesus remains, that would have shocked the people. That was shocking. That was offensive because it flipped upside down their total understanding on how things worked. And so in our life in 2021, it's just as scandalous to say, I don't have to search. I don't have to chase because I have an identity that is found in Christ. I don't have to hate people. I don't have to judge people. I don't have to put myself above other people because Jesus never did that to me. Instead, he laid down his life for me. Only Jesus remains. Mark chapter nine, verse nine continues. Says, As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the son of man had risen from the dead. Verse 10 says, they kept this matter to themselves. Look at this, discussing what rising from the dead meant. What's this guy talking about? Now, I love this moment 
because in this moment, James, Peter, and John have seen the glory of Jesus. In this moment, there is absolutely no doubt that he is the Messiah, he is the Savior, he is the one that they are looking for. And then on their way down, Jesus says, hey, don't say anything until after I'm dead and have risen from the dead. You see, the reason that they're confused is because if Jesus has just been glorified as God and Savior, their idea of God and Savior is not someone that would lay down their life. Their idea was power. Their, their idea was clout. That everyone would know who we are. Our identity is in him. But what you need to understand is that in the new way of Jesus, it is not about self-piety. It's about self-sacrifice. It's not about religion. It's about a Jesus and a Savior that laid down his life for us. You see, religion, get this, says do, but Jesus says done. He's done it, which means I don't have to work anymore. I don't have to try to build up my resume or my accomplishments. Jesus did what I could never do. And so my standing with God has zero to do with what I do. It's only found in Jesus. It's only Jesus. I said, it's only Jesus. You see, come on. Paul had this way of understanding it. And so he told the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, he said, you know what? I decided that I, when I, while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ and Christ crucified. My message is one thing and one thing only. It's only Jesus. Because only Jesus saves. Only Jesus restores. Only Jesus does what I could never do myself. He gives me new life, new hope today. Let's just stand for a second, church. In this moment, I want to give us an opportunity to lay down whatever crowns we have. And a crown is just something that you have that you think puffs you up, puts you above other people. This moment, I want to lay it down for Jesus. And so maybe You've had other things in your life that you've worshipped, other things in your life you've built your identity on, other things in your life that you've looked to for hope. Right now in this moment, I want to give it to Jesus. So right now, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If you want to just give it to Jesus, I just want to encourage you right now in, in an act of surrender, just to say, Jesus, is only you. I only want it to be you. I just want you to open your hands up and just give it to Jesus. Just release it to Jesus. God, I pray today that everything that we do, we can put it in your hands, God. Help us to never forget the sacrifice. Help us never to forget what you have done for us. We thank you, Jesus, that we no longer live in the old way, but we can live in your new way. We love you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Everyone said amen. Hey, thank you so much for listening to that message. We hope that that encouraged and inspired you. We want to connect with you. So if you would head over to kingdomchurch.ca, we would love to get in contact with you. We don't want this online experience to be the end, but just the beginning. So fill the connect card. There's so many ways to connect. If you want to give financially, hey, we thank you in advance. Your generosity helps us and do ministry in St. Albert and ministry in this church. So we can't wait to get to know you. Fill the connect card. We love you. Take care.